I've played a lot of strategy games over the years, enough to know when something is strangely unique. That is the case for today's game, Rise and Fall Civilizations at War. It's an RTS set roughly in the last millennium of the BC era, featuring four different civilizations to play and fight. I actually had a box copy of this game for years, but I lost it in a move. This is a bit of an oldie released back in June of 2006 by publisher Midway Games. Now if you've seen the Area 51 video, you should know Midway kinda sucked at being financially solvent in this general time frame. Which is why I want to talk about Rise and Fall's development before talking about the game itself. Rise and Fall was developed by Stainless Steel Studios. These were the guys who made Empire Earth, the origin of commonly used documentary stock music. The game was developed over the course of a year from 2005 to 2006. Yeah, it was developed in a little over a year. If you think that's nuts, listen to this. Development stopped in November of 2005 with the sudden closure of Stainless Steel Studios. The cause, according to studio founder Rick Goodman, was that Midway had cut funding for the game after a delay in release from October of 2005 to early 2006. Meaning, they had wanted this game done in under a year. This in turn caused the studio to lay off all of its employees and halting development of Rise and Fall. The game was unfinished, likely weeks away from gold according to ex-studio employee Daniel Higgins. Work on the game would be finished by an in-house developer, Midway Studio San Diego. Though finish might be a strong word. Made playable is probably a more apt description in more ways than one. Because as the game's executive producer, Mark Cadwell, states, We never received any current assets before Stainless Steel shut down, so we had to rely on an archive of code and data to try and piece together the current version. Meaning they basically had to start from scratch and figure out what data went with what code. It had to have been a grueling process for those developers who had this dropped into their laps. Now, personally, I think it's unethical that you can pull funding from a studio, take their work, and ultimately profit from it without providing compensation to the original developer. Oh, and then crediting those developers as external production instead of as the proper development team they were. Midway had some mad disrespect for developers. I guess they got what was coming from them in the end, but it really didn't happen soon enough. Rise and Fall received middling review scores, and sales would represent this too. Except for the UK, where the game was commercially successful. It would eventually be released for free in 2008 by... the US Air Force? Wait a minute! The game is technically freeware, but honestly, it's functionally abandonware because it's not actively maintained and is not offered for download by any digital store place. So, to acquire it, you're gonna have to either find a physical copy, or you could find it through one of those disreputable websites that hosts downloads for old video games in legal limbo. The point is that Rise and Fall had trouble development, and its flaws can be attributed in part to it. But it's not the only cause for the flaws. For now, we're going to be talking about the visual presentation. So we will just boot up the game and... Oh, come on! Okay, so despite this being released for free, the Abandonware version of the game does not recognize mouse movement. This makes it virtually unplayable. To fix this, you're going to have to edit some registry files. Press the Windows key and R to get to the Run menu. Type regedit into the search bar and hit OK. Find the file for Rise and Fall under the current user. Look for the line that says Use Direct Input to Update Mouse. Click on it to change its value from 0 to 1. Relaunch the game and this should solve your problem. In case you're also having trouble getting the game to launch, here's a crack I found to run it without the DVD. My game runs fine without it, but you never know. Now, I have to say, I'm actually pretty impressed with Rise and Fall visually. For a 16-year-old game, it has really held up in comparison to some of its contemporaries. 3D models of this era can look fairly muddy, especially in something like an RTS which is played from a distant point of view. But the models here are generally very clean looking, not to mention fairly well detailed. Each faction has their own distinct style that's reflected in their buildings and units. One of those great minor details is that the UI background will also change depending on what faction you're playing. It ultimately shows that a lot of care went into Rise and Fall's visual presentation. This was a game that used a lot of motion capture work, so as a result, everything feels very fluid. I'm especially a fan of the building animations where a building is slowly erected in front of your eyes. Though there are a couple like the boat sinking animations that seem to be mistimed a bit. The water isn't anything impressive, but the land deformations caused by ships beaching are for the time. Oh, and Rise and Fall even runs at 1440p with no problems. 
For a game where I had to edit registry values, I was not expecting it to run as well as it does. Especially considering it did not crash on me at all during the 16-ish hours I played for this review. Now that's not to say that Rise and Fall is without its visual or performance quirks. Every unit type has a high level of detail, but there's no variation between any two of the same model. The collisions can also be problematic. Units especially tend to get stuck getting on or off boats. The music of Rise and Fall is fitting, if predictably generic. Nothing really stands out to me except for the main theme. It's an orchestral soundtrack with almost no individualistic flair. Interestingly though, Jason Graves co-composed and produced the soundtrack. He was the composer of the Dead Space trilogy, among other things. The sound quality is pretty good in general. Everything is crisp and no sound in particular is too grating, except for maybe some of those alert noises. I'm really not a fan of the voice acting. It's nothing special, just kind of blandly generic. Wood has come back. Your brother Tiberius and Memnon were seen fleeing to the east. Tiberius had donned the king's crown. Tiberius? In the king's crown? Though I will say, them fucking up Aristotle's name in the Alexander campaign is hilarious to me. To what lengths will you go in meeting your stated goal? Come with me, Aristander, and find out. What is not so funny is the campaign cutscene volumes. They're tied to your system's audio level rather than any of the in-game audio sliders. Scared the shit out of me the first time one of these videos played, and I had to continuously take off my headset for the rest of my playthrough. The gameplay is of course the main draw of any RTS. And I have to say, I'm ultimately not sure how I feel about it. I'll try to explain it in a bit of detail. It plays like a standard RTS for the most part, with some important caveats. To make it ahead in life, you're gonna need three resources. Hardwood, cash money, and the bluster to convince people you have both. The first two are used for constructing buildings and units, while Renown is a resource spent on upgrading your units, hero, and faction. Wood and gold are gathered from trees and piles via SCVs, I mean slaves. These resources are finite, so you will need to explore and construct multiple bases if you want to ensure victory. Each faction uses the same set of buildings. This includes a town center to create peasants, a dock for boating, a barracks for soldiers, a stable for a non-Trojan horse, a granary to increase the unit cap, a wall to keep the sea peoples out, and a statue to generate glory. There are exceptions to the rule, like how Greece has an extra building for training Spartans. Interestingly, the game's manual has descriptions about hidden bonuses for each faction, like how the Romans gain more taxation revenue and the Egyptians' buildings have more health. Seriously, if you're going to play this, I highly suggest reading the manual for some hints. I'll include a link to it in the description. Things begin to become interesting with the units. Each faction has access to the same basic roster of units. Swordsmen, Spearmen, Archers, and Cavalry. The typical RTS rock-paper-scissors setup is here, with the additional Swordsmen getting pretty much countered by everything, though they make for good fodder. Where things begin to get a little interesting is with the unit formations. Each individual model is selectable and can be grouped together in units as small as eight. You can take small formations and combine them together by right-clicking one onto another or you can split them up with the push of a button. This allows for a level of micro I hadn't really thought possible and haven't really seen since. It's a really interesting mechanic, but I ultimately feel that it's somewhat unfinished. There's no other formation available outside the standard rectangular block. Units can sometimes get left behind by this game's less than stellar pathfinding. This causes formations to break up and force you to gather stragglers after travel or a fight. This was one of those Empire Earth flaws I mentioned earlier. While I'm here, I might as well talk about the AI as well. It generally sucks shit, and the only way it can get ahead in life is by being a dirty cheating bastard, because it's really dumb. When you scale up the difficulty, the AI doesn't become better, it just simply gets more resources than you. This is one of my least favorite solutions to creating video game difficulty, and it is far too common amongst RTS games. Units can be leveled up into stronger versions of themselves with each level your faction hero gains. These levels are acquired by spending renown gained over the course of the game. Each faction has two heroes to recruit, each with their own advantages and disadvantages. They're essentially your faction leader for the match. 
Take note, though, that some liberty has been taken with these heroes. It's mostly Persia. Sargon II and Nebuchadnezzar are leaders who lived and died before the existence of the classic Persian Empire. Technically, they were in the same area, but the Assyrians and Babylonians were different cultures and civilizations. The rest of the hero choices are more appropriate. Egypt has Ramses the Great and Cleopatra, Greece has Alexander the Great and Achilles, even though he might not be real, and Rome has Julius and Germanicus Caesar. The heroes feature in one of the main gameplay draws for Rise and Fall, which is third-person combat. When your hero reaches level 2, they will begin to gain stamina. When enough stamina is gathered, you can press Q to take direct control of your hero. You can fight in melee combat, use a bow and arrow to snipe from afar, or lead your armies personally on a frontal assault of the enemy base. While in hero mode, your hero's health will not take any damage, only the stamina bar. If your hero were to fall in combat, they'll respawn at the most recently constructed town center. It's one of those few games that tries to combine real-time strategy with aspects from other game genres. There's a handful of other games that have tried to do this exact same thing. Unfortunately, while I do like the idea of the mode, I don't think the execution was that great. The combat as a hero lacks any real depth. All I'm doing is spamming my left mouse button while tearing through enemies. And most enemies will go down with a single shot from a bow, making the only real difficulty my lack of accuracy. Maybe they could have added some kind of nuance to your attacks with the addition of a power attack. I mean, give me something other than just smashing my left mouse button to victory. Each level gained by a hero unlocks a section of upgrades called Advisors. These upgrades can range from increasing resource gain rate to giving your units the ability to self-heal over time. A lot of these abilities are incredibly powerful and should not be ignored in any game. The Advisors cost renown, so you'll have to be careful to keep your hero strength and your faction strength in balance. Naval combat was another selling point to Rise and Fall. I have to say, I'm quite fond of it, if only for its uniqueness. Ships are upgradable akin to soldiers, with there being three tiers of boating. Galleys are small and quick, triremes are large and slow, and biremes cut it down the middle. But you should get to triremes as quickly as possible because they become floating artillery pieces. Naval combat can be played out by either having ships board one another, or by ramming at full speed. Boarding causes the soldiers aboard to duke it out over who will control both ships while ramming will just simply destroy the victim. Either of these options requires special units that can only be recruited on these boats. By the way, did I mention how your boats are able to train the three basic units? This makes them akin to a floating barracks that you can land behind enemy lines and continually pump units from. I may have used this strategy a few times. And if you thought the pathfinding on land was bad, then you should really reevaluate your opinion when you see the naval pathfinding. Boats can sometimes pull in Ever Given if the area around them is not clear. And even then, they can have trouble. Before moving on from naval combat, I do want to show just how many troops these ships are able to handle. I use this as proof that our ancient ancestors may have understood quantum entanglement far better than we ever could. No RTS game based off Age of Empires will be complete without siege combat. The walls you build to keep other factions out can also be used against you. When this happens, there are a couple options. You can either politely knock open the door, hire two coyotes with a 31-foot ladder to scale over the wall, or make your own door. Each faction can create special siege units to counter the turtling strategy, although one of them is always going to be some kind of large rock-throwing device. But sometimes you get something fantastical like the Greek flaming lion. The last bit of gameplay is that the maps have these capturable buildings called outposts. These usually have hostile NPC defenders who range from a complete joke to holy shit why am I fighting tier 5 swordsmen right outside my starting base. They usually serve as good areas to build bases around. The skirmish mode features a variety of maps that are made for between 2 and 8 players. While I have not played every map, the ones I did were fairly balanced. They're mostly trying to emulate the regions of the ancient Mediterranean, meaning that it's mostly going to be green with trees or brown with sand in a few trees. Now, when talking about skirmish, I also have to talk about my biggest critique for Rise and Fall, and that is the average match length. Most of my skirmish battles were an hour plus fights that usually took about 20 minutes to ramp up at all, and adding more players can make the game drag out even longer. It's a problem that Empire Earth suffered from, and unfortunately this just seems to be a part of the game's DNA. So if you want to play a match of any kind, make sure you also set aside enough time to actually play it. There are two campaigns that are featured with Rise and Fall. One features a fairly bastardized version of Alexander the Great's rise to power, while the other is an alternate history what if Mark Antony didn't commit Sudoku and Cleopatra didn't poison herself. 
They were made with the game's included scenario editor. This was apparently to prove to players what they could create for themselves. I'm always personally a fan when developers give fans tools like this to let their imaginations go wild. Alright, I'm going to talk a little bit about the contents of the Alexander campaign, so here's a spoiler warning if you want to avoid game spoilers mixed with real life spoilers. Both campaigns are historically inaccurate, but I take particular offense to the historicity of Alexander the Great's campaign. Which, to be fair, the historicity of Alexander the Great should always be taken with a grain of salt. Most contemporary sources about Alexander the Great have been lost to history, so we have to rely upon the remaining five primary resources. One of whom is Plutarch. Now, 99% of people won't know or care. He was a biographer slash philosopher slash writer from the early Roman Empire. He wrote an epic biography about famous Romans and Greeks that focuses more on morality than actual history. Seriously, the dude's works are full of anecdotes. And he had the gall to criticize Herodotus, Padre Maximo of history and anthropology, for misrepresentations and falsehoods in histories. Not to mention that Plutarch is one of the only sources we have about ancient Spartan life and culture. They didn't write anything down until after the death of Alexander the Great. Plutarch visited Sparta during his lifetime and wrote down a bunch of ancient customs he'd heard for his biographies. But this was centuries after such practices were abandoned and had likely been altered by oral retelling. Not to mention his own biases as a Greek living in the Roman Empire likely affected his writing. This is why you should never look too deep, kids. Most of the time you'll end up disappointed in what you find. Where was I? Oh yeah, the historicity of Alexander the Great. So, it basically follows along the lines of Alexander the Great is an untested commander whose father, Philip II, has been assassinated in a conspiracy by Alexander's older brother, Tiberius, and a Persian general named Memnon. You fight your way through parts of Greece to what I'm pretty sure is southern Lebanon, setting up Alexander's future conquests of the known world. The route you take in game is actually somewhat accurate to Alexander's early conquests. Only, as I've said before, the contents are horribly bastardized. For starters, while Alexander did have an older half-brother, his name was Aridaeus, not Tiberius, which is a very Roman name. Aridaeus was a bit of a slow child and mostly served as a pawn or figurehead for those around him. Ari would eventually be executed by Alexander the Great's mom during the chaotic power struggles after Alex's death. There was a Memnon that fought for the Persian Empire, but he was a Greek from Rhodes that was the captain of a band of mercenaries. Though, to be fair, his sister married a Persian satrap, so he was essentially nobility-in-law. He tried attacking Alexander on land before beginning a naval guerrilla warfare campaign to capture Greek islands to force Alexander home. Honestly, this might have worked out if he had not been bodied by an island of lesbians. Memnon was probably the person who came closest to defeating Alexander the Great outside of Alexander's own soldiers, whom, for the most part, greatly respected him throughout his conquests mostly due to the fact that he was a fairly good military commander, having started leading troops around age 16. That was two whole years before Philip II's death, not to mention the fact that he never lost a major recorded battle. It was apparently only by his soldiers' homesick demands that Alexander the Great curbed his ambitions of conquest. So Philip II's death is probably the most egregious bit here. To this day, 2,357 years later, we are still unclear of the exact reasoning behind the assassination of Philip II. We know Philip was stabbed by Pausinius, one of his own bodyguards, but Pausinius was stabbed before he could squeak. The only contemporary account we have is from Chad Aristotle, who says that the king was stabbed because his uncle-in-law, Attalus, offended Pausinius. Historians still debate who done it, but I'm more than willing to believe the father of logic on this one. Knowing the ancient Greeks, they were all drunk as shit, and somebody probably got too free with their love and feelings got hurt. Long story short, this game's version of bad history made me spiteful enough to do hours of research to prove it wrong. 6 out of 10. No RTS would be complete without a multiplayer feature. However, the multiplayer was run on GameSpy servers, and they are about as dead as this horse I keep beating. But there is the ability to get a LAN game going, so you could theoretically get a virtual LAN up to play with the boys. I've never actually played this game against other humans, so I honestly have no idea what that's like. At the end of it all, I'm ultimately not sure how I feel about Rise and Fall. It has some great ideas, but the execution leaves a lot to be desired. The whole game feels like it's half-baked. I still can't quite put my finger on it, but I'm gonna try. 
Obviously Rise and Fall would be much improved if many of the kinks were ironed out and the pathfinding reworked. But even then, it feels like there's some critical component missing. I often came away from games with a sense of frustration rather than satisfaction. I can blame part of this on the match length times, but it can't just be that. I've played Civ games that have gone through the night and had a blast. Part of me thinks that an additional faction or two would have been helpful, and there's enough Mediterranean civilizations to include at least the Carthaginians or the Phoenicians. But even then, I don't think that would solve anything. Because ultimately, I think this game falls flat because of how it lacks strategical depth. There's nothing outside the standard RTS rock-paper-scissors to make this game engaging on a strategic level. No flanking, no high ground, no line of sight, outside of the fog of war. I am basically used the same strategy for each skirmish or mission I played. Build a blob army, send them at the enemy with support from my navy if there's a shoreline nearby. I never got punished by the brain-dead AI for doing the same strategy over and over again. I assume more effort did not go into the RTS part of the game due to the third person mode. And ultimately, I think I could have gone without that hero mode because it doesn't really add anything substantial to the game in the end. It was simply a gimmick to ship boxes, and it might have worked in some areas of the world. It is for all these reasons that despite being free, I'm not sure if Rise and Fall Civilizations at War is worth a revisit by most. Because unless you're really dedicated, I don't see most people attempting to change registry values for a game that's more frustrating than fun. I hope you guys enjoyed this one, and thank you for watching. Under attack!